Welcome. Today we're going to go through ProfitTrack Point of Sale, also known as PT Pods, or the basics for it. If you haven't seen the ProfitTrack Basics video, it's going to be linked in the top right now. So this will be a basic run through of how to use Pods from an operator standpoint. Now during this, I'm going to reference it as PT Pods, which stands for ProfitTrack Point of Sale, just for reference. So what we're looking at on the screen right now is the locked screen. So the lock screen is something that someone can put up when they're leaving the point of sale temporarily. So this is, I'm going to lock my point of sale so that I can go do a quick stock count while there's no one in the store or clean you know, the floors, whatever it may be. So I'm just going to lock it. So it's locked by, in this case, YT Pause. That's my user, YouTube point of sale. It was locked on 13th of the 4th, 21, 9, 14am. That's fine. Now, what we'll cover is the server light, hold light, and draw light. So the server light comes in four colors, green, yellow, red, and light green. So that is the standard green there, which is just, I'm signed into the point of sale, I'm connected to the server. The light green is I'm connected to the server, but I'm not logged in. We are technically logged in right now, but we are locked. Yellow is I either have an upgrade outstanding or there's an issue with the database, in which case contact support. And you can tell by clicking on that little dot what it's trying to tell you. So if it is yellow, click on it, it might say, hey, it's a different version, in which case you need to upgrade. Or in the case of it being green, it's gonna say it's connected. And red is cannot see the server. So that most commonly is because the server is either closed or locked up if the computer's been up for a long time in the back office, in which case just need to restart it. So the hold light would usually be green. I have a held sale outstanding. If you put a sale on hold, that is so that you can pick it up again at a later date, also that you can pick it up at a different point of sale. So I have a held sale outstanding right now, thus it's flashing yellow and red. It would be green if I didn't. Draw, that's indicating if we're over the limit of the cash draw. So if we set a limit on the draw, we'll use a silly example here, but a dollar, and I put $2 in the draw, it's gonna start flashing at me saying, hey, you've exceeded the limit. And that basically is just an indicator to do a safe drop. Now we're green at the moment, that's because it's a new shift. So there's no problem there. So we've got Restart Pause and Restart PC on the left here. Restart Pause is just this software that will restart. Restart PC will restart the whole computer that the software is on. So most commonly, the Restart Pause or Restart the software will happen every day by itself. You don't really have to do that too often. Restart PC, I'd recommend you do quite a bit more often. End Shift is to end the YT pause. I'll do that now. So you'd click end shift, you'd put in or scan the password. For me, that's 1996. Log in. This will end your shift. Are you sure? Yes. Communicates with server. Done. End shift. So this is the blank screen. This is what you'll want to be at every morning when the store opens. And you'll notice we have an extra option now. We have shut down PC. So you'll want to use shut down PC in a couple of scenarios. One is that maybe renovations are about to start in the store and you're closing for a few days. You want to shut it down just so that they're not in use, don't get damaged by someone plugging, unplugging the power cable by accident. Or perhaps you've had a power outage and you're running off UPS power and you need to shut down the unit as the UPS gets lower on battery. That's the idea behind the shutdown PC. Works the same way as clicking shut down through Windows. Now at this point, you've also got end day. End day is more for fuel sites than it is for supermarkets. If you are a fuel site and you click that, it sends through all your fuel data to the back office so that you can do reconciliation on your dips and meters. If you're a supermarket, you don't need that function. There's an automatic one that will do the actual sales data end of day, although you can use that as well. So we'll sign back in. This is our point of sale. Now, this isn't standard. This can be very, very different depending on which store you're looking at. Though the standard that we do have is what you see at the top here and this quick access menu. This is the, we're in the quick access menu at the moment, the home. This is all the very common touch items. So for this store, it, it looks like they sell a lot of, it looks like base foods. So breakfast foods sort of thing and lunch and dinner. Yep. All right. I have moved some of this around in one of the other videos. So I know that the dinner menu under breakfast doesn't make sense. That's okay. We're just going to move on. So in here. We've got the options to get back to that previous screen, which is lock up here. If you're using the older keyboard model, which doesn't look quite like this, it will actually have an image of a padlock on it. 
and then you go here. All right. So there is one more thing I wanted to talk about, which is the cache declare itself, which is the N shift 1996 login. And we've now got a cache declare button there. So that is an optional thing. We don't need to do this, but I'm going to cover it because it is used by quite a lot of stores. So when I click on that, it's going to ask me for my credentials, 1996, we'll log in. So we've got the two from this morning. Now these are empty. I haven't done any transactions, but we'll go through it anyway. Declare. So it's going to say, all right, you have a cash and a hey you tender. So how much is in the draw? How much is in the draw? So you'd put in your totals, $50. Enter, it would go to hey you, you could do that. I'm gonna say I didn't do any of those transactions, just the cash, that's fine. Process, draws not balance, process anyway. Now, it intentionally doesn't say what the draw balance is, but we'll process that, and then it will tell you what it expected. So, as I said, we hadn't done any transactions, so zero dollars is exactly what I expected, and we did $50 cash. So we'll exit that, that is the shift attended. So we could declare that one as well. I'm going to leave that at zero because that's exactly what it was. That's fine. All right. So that's cash declare. It's just a way to balance the till. And then theoretically, you would get it recounted by your manager in the back office during the end of day management process. So again, we can sign in by scanning our user card or our clerk card, or we can key it in. So I'm going to key it in at 1996. In we are. So down the bottom, you can see we're lane one, clerk 13, YT pause. Now, the other thing to point out is all of these down here in the bottom right stand for a hardware peripheral or software peripheral. So PTR in red will start there because it's the one that's lit up, stands for the receipt printer. Now it, much like the server, has the three colors, green, yellow, red, stoplight system. Red being not connected at all, can't see it. So I don't have a printer plugged into my machine, so we got a red. Green being everything's working, good to go. Yellow being I have a problem, but I am connected. You'll commonly see that one more with a printer than anything else because when the receipt paper gets low, it's trying to warn you, you need to replace the paper. Now, black is the other color. You can see that on a lot of them down there. Black is I'm not configured to talk to a device. So there's a scanner there, a scale there, a display draw, things like that. I haven't set any of those up. I haven't told the pods to look for them, therefore they're black. I have told the pods to look for a printer, but the printer's not connected, therefore it's red. So, moving along from that, if we bring up a couple of items, oyster, eggs, eggs, special sandwich, sandwich. There's our items. The one highlighted is the last one scanned. It will tell us in the top right that we've scanned X amount of items, in this case five, and our subtotal, $50.75. Now, going through that, we'll talk about some of the things we can do. So we can void any item. Now, when we click that, it's gonna go void in orange up here. And what that will do is remove any iteration of the item that we're about to scan from the transaction. So we've got oysters half dozen up there. If I click oysters here, while I've got the void on, it's gonna remove it from the transaction. Now, if I try that with the oysters, and there's no oysters already on the transaction, we're gonna get an error saying the item cannot be voided because it's not in the transaction. Now, alternatively, if we just wanted to remove the last one, we could click error correct. It will always remove the last thing. So in this case, our void of oysters, negative one. Error correct can be configured one of two ways, either just to remove the last item or to be continually pressed like I just did there to mark the next item off as well. So in this case, a sandwich, we didn't want that, that was an error. So we corrected it. Cancel sale, pretty self-explanatory, but if we click that and then yes, the sale will be canceled. So I'll just go back through and add those real quick. There we go, there's our items. We got our hold and recall, like we talked about before. So clicking hold, puts it on hold. It will print out a receipt with a barcode on it. You can either scan the barcode to bring it back or you can click on recall. Here's all of our transactions. Looks like there's a bunch here already, but that's the one we just did. I'm going to click OK and it comes back. So that's the idea behind that. So clear is the other one. So I'll cancel this really quickly. If I click void again, it's void up here. Then if I click clear over here, it will remove the void. It's to remove anything that's outstanding up the top. So quantity, you'd click the number and then click quantity. 
So we want five quantity, and you can see up there in orange, quantity five. Click on oysters. We've now got five at $16.99, totaling $84.95. So that's how quantity works. So we'll cancel that. One of the other functionalities I want to talk about really quickly isn't one that's used commonly. It's usually a change it once, don't have to think about it again. Our POS will either print receipts automatically or on demand. So I've got receipt on slash off here, and you can see receipt off up here. So right now it's printing every receipt automatically, which is why I didn't connect a printer. Now if I click that, it goes orange, which means it will only print a receipt if it's demanded to be. So we've got the transaction here. Let's just bring that up. Once I tender this, let's say 50 and 10, it's on screen. I can click reprint. It's just print a receipt, but only because I clicked reprint. The idea behind that is to save on receipt paper so that we're not going through a roll every day. So after that, we'll talk about a product search. So you can see here we've got a product. Now this might have a different naming depending on your keyboard, but that's the default. So I can search, let's say cola. It's a very common item. Most stores have that. All right, not what I expected. That's fine. And it'll come up with anything that fits that title. So I've gone cola. So it's this C-O-L-A in the chocolate there. That's fine. And then you can select the item to bring it up. Alternatively, while you're in there, you can also search product code or barcode to bring it up that way too. So I'll cancel that. So we'll go through the subtotal screen. So I'll bring up some of our items again, our $54, our five transactions there. So in subtotal, every screen is going to look similar. Again, if you have the old keyboard layout, it's going to look a little different. I've done videos in the past on how to change keyboard layouts, but typically you'll have a tender amount in notes. So these will either be the image of the note or like this. So you can click on $50 and $5 and that would tender. So there's a transaction complete. Let's bring that back up. Alternatively, you can do a set amount of cash, set amount of FPOS. Now, what you want to do with a split tender is always make sure cash comes last. So you want to do your FPOS or whichever tender first. So to do that, you'd go 20 like that. So you can see $20 there. Hit FPOS. It's going to ask me, in this case, I've got manual FPOS. I should point that out. There is two methods for FPOS, manual and integrated. Manual is where you would go, right, it's going to be under FPOS accept and then it will ask for approval. During that, you need to type it into your terminal and get them to either pay pass or savings or whatever have you, versus integrated, which is where if you went $20 like I did there, hit FPOS, it's gonna pop up a screen saying, hey, please swipe or insert your card. And that's what you ask them to do. They do that, it'll take the total off. So you can see there, we've done $20 in FPOS. It's changed the subtotal to $34.80 remaining. So I could then go, right, well, I'm, they're going to give me a $50 note, and there we go, that's the difference. Or alternatively, we can go, you know, $34.80 if they had the exact change, and go cash, and the transaction's complete. So that's split tendering. So the other two things to cover is products not found, which we'll do now. So if I scan this product really quickly, it's going to say product not found, print unfound PLU receipt. You want to click yes to that to print the receipt, which I've done here. So I'll swap over to my camera. So what you're looking at here is the product not found receipt. So <clears throat> this is one I printed a little bit earlier. It's the same product, same PLU. But basically, the idea is if someone scans the product, it's not found, they print this quickly, write down the description of the product at the end of their shift, give it to their manager, manager puts it into the system so that it always goes through correctly. Now, main reason for this is so that pricing and profit is kept very standard because the big problem would be that once that's not scanned, they still need to sell that item. So they'll put it through an open key, something to that effect so that they can get the customer sold. Now, the sell price, unless they happen to know what it is, may not be correct, meaning either higher or lower profits than what was ticketed which can cause problems. So you always wanna make sure that that's written down, given to the manager, added to the system with the correct cost and sell so that you can track your profit correctly. Now, with that being said, the next one that we're gonna bring up is age restricted items. So I'll bring up a product, which was our Cascade Light. Now, the reason I do dot dot search here, I'm gonna point this out, is 
Same reason as what we do in the back office, if you watch the basics video on that. Cascade dot dot light is saying cascade and light. It's needing both of those criteria to bring up a result. If I did a space, it's saying cascade or light. So any product with the word cascade or light in it will come up. So I'll search that. We've only got two. I'm going to bring up this one. Age verification required. Ask for ID. So it's going to ask for which type. It's going to say that, hey, they need to be born on or before the 13th of the 4th, 2003. And then you can either say, yep, they're over the age or no ID. So if it's over age, it allowed no ID, not provided, do not give the product to the customer. That's age restricted. So that's typically on your alcohol, uh, cigarette items and knives, stuff like that. But you'll need to mark that in the back office system so that it shows up like that on the point of sale. Now we'll talk about the account side of things. So not everyone has that functionality, but there is account charge and account payment. So if I go bring up our items again, go to our subtotal, I can go look up. We can do a dot dot search to bring them all up. I'm going to bring up my account. That's fine. Okay. So it's charged. Oh, sorry, it's looked up to the account. So there's our transaction. So in this case, myself, I've gone up. I've bought oysters, yada, yada, yada. I've gone, here's my account card, either scan or, hey, my name's Jared. Can you put it on my account? And then charge to account. Now, as it says there, I've got no credit on that account. So this account system, all again, completely editable in the back office, requires you to have credit on the account before you make any purchases, which makes total sense. So how do we fix that? Quite easy, actually. So what we'll do, we'll look up the account again. We'll do a dot dot search. That's fine. And we're going to do an account payment this time. And we're going to say, all right, he's going to give us, you know, $150, for example. So we'll say 150 cash. There we go. So now my account has $150 on it. So if I bring up this at a later date, I can go right, look up my account. Right. Go charge to account. It's going to print out a receipt going, hey, can you please get him to sign? Is it correct? If so, accept. It's been charged to my account. Now, won't go into too much of that on the point of sale session, more so on the others. But essentially, the debtors system can be set up a whole bunch of different ways where either there is a limit to the credit, so maybe I'm allowed to go $50 negative, and the system will send out email statements at the end of the month saying, hey, you owe X amount of money, yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> this system set up so that no credit has to be on, has to have cash available in the account, which is fine. Now, with that being said, the last one I wanted to cover is safe drop. So we talked about it before. The draw limit there so typically under the function menu there is a safe drop which is just there so when you click on that it's going to ask you how much safe or how much cash you want to drop into the safe so you would type it in depending on how much you're dropping i'm just going to say 500 for now although i don't think it'll work because there's not that much in my till but in this case it's been asked for a reference enter there we go and done so that is all of our special functions. That is how to do basic transactions and split tenders and so on. If you want more training on point of sound, some of the things it can do, call us on 1-800-020-946. We can organize a training session. Otherwise, I hope it was helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.